I'm going to ask you just a simple question. And it's a conversation that you and I have had multiple times. How did we get to the point where you and I are having this conversation in January of 2021 of why, why Coach Flores needs to be in the Hall of Fame? How did we get here? Well, you know, what's interesting, Eddie, and, and thanks for having me on here, is that this conversation probably should have been had a decade ago, if not before then. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's great that we're having the conversation. If for nothing else, it means that he's at the doorstep. And he was at the doorstep a couple of years ago. He probably should have got in last year with that special blue ribbon uh, committee they put together. Didn't happen. But now here we are. The, the Hall of Fame and its wisdom, so to speak, has put together these separate categories where there's a certain it's, – it's just a coach. A coach will go in as a part of this class, uh, or at least the coach is nominated for this class. And, and it's a simple yes or no vote uh, for this – for the committee. And, and you go from there. So – based on his body of work as a coach. And then in the back of the voters' minds, a, a little bit, you got to think it's everything else that the man has done for professional football. Uh, you know, I'm sure we'll get into the resume later, but it's, it's, it's nice that we're having the conversation, albeit it should have happened 10 years ago. But, hey, I'm sure he'll take it. His family will take it. And Raider Nation and, and uh, people that observe the game and love the game will take it as well. I mean, a thousand percent. And we talked about the body of work. And like you said, Paul, we are going to talk about that in a sec. But I guess I just don't understand from someone who obviously has not covered this team as long as you have and has the history with Coach Flores that you do. I guess I just don't understand the logic for him not being in, if that makes sense. Like when you look at it, when you look at it on yeah. paper, you go, this is a Hall of Famer. So I guess I just don't understand why, it, why we have even gotten to this point. Yeah, and I think a lot of it goes to the way the the process works. Um, there becomes a logjam, and if guys don't get in right away, they kind of become forgotten. Uh, the main thing that has been held against Tom for all these years is he took over a team that was good and then won a Super Bowl with them, and then the team moved and won another Super Bowl. At that point, you think, okay, hey, done, automatic Hall of Famer. I've been banging this drum since at least – uh, for at least 15 years or so, when I worked at the Sacramento Bee, to CSNBayArea.com, to ESPN now. Why, why is Tom Flores not uh, a candidate, let alone in the hall? Same thing with Jim Plunkett. Um, and, and I think a lot of it, actually I know in talking to, to selectors and voters, is, is that he was overshadowed as a coach. He's not a guy that was a me-first guy. He wasn't banging his chest. He wasn't saying, hey, look at me. He just quietly went about his job and won. Same thing as a player when he was the Iceman. And, and I know, again, it's interesting with the new campaign for him there, too. But he wasn't a self-promoter. And when you look at a lot of the coaches that get in, what do they all have in common? They're on TV. They're in your living room. They're in your face. They're getting that attention. So for, for Tom to get this, this shine now, so to speak, it's way overdue. But it's interesting that, that now he's getting the attention and he's, he's in TV screens and now people are talking about it a lot, though. Yeah, and you and I were talking about this before we started rolling, and we've talked about this a handful of times, right? Is that Raiders fatigue? You hear that term yeah. thrown around so often. And to me, the one thing that I don't understand is that the Hall of Fame is supposed to be for the best of the best, the creme de la creme. And when you talk about this Raiders fatigue, oh, there's too many guys that have gone in. Doesn't that, isn't that counterintuitive, right? You want the best people. So it feels like you're almost punishing the organization for having that sustained success during that era. And I just, I, it's just hard for me to kind of stomach that and hard for me to kind of make sense of, if Raiders fatigue is a real thing and why, like why that's even in, in our lexicon right now, you know? Yeah. And, and that's part of it too, Eddie, is when you look at the way the, the hall of fame class is selected, you've got people that go into a room and, and I, I wrote this story, I want to say in 2006, 2007, and it's not to take a shot at the, the selectors that are in there. I believe it's up to 46 selectors are in a room discussing it. Um, but I was told by one of the, you know, foremost known renowned NFL writers at the time, Dr. Z from mm -hmm. Sports Illustrated. And I asked him, hey, when did you first start voting for the Hall of Fame? And, and he's gone now, so rest in peace, Dr. Z. But he told me he, the only way he could remember is because it was a Hall of Fame vote where he had to vote for somebody that he didn't necessarily thought deserved to be in the Hall. I'm like, wait, what, a minute, what, what are you talking about? He said, because they basically go in there and they have to sponsor their guys. Each team is ba basically has a sponsor that walks in and presents a case, and then they vote about it. And then there's a lot of backroom kind of deals that happen. And I'm not trying to, to – these people that do this work, they're doing the heavy lifting. I'm not going to diminish what they do. But it, it, a lot of times it comes down to that. So if I want Tom Flores in, for example, uh, somebody else wants somebody else in, I might have to grin and bear it because I need that guy's vote. I need that support. I need that politicking going on. And for Tom Flores, what else would hurt him as well is that coaches before this year, uh, before the Blue Ribbon Committee – in uh, last year too, they were competing against other players. So if you're a voter and you're looking at a player versus a coach, where are you going to go? 
you're mm-hmm. most likely going to go with the, with the player. So he just kept getting pushed to the back of the line, back of the line, back of the line. And then again, two other things that really hurt him was the Al Davis factor. A lot of people saw him as, oh, he was just an Al Davis puppet. Not true. And uh, John Madden dealt with that a lot at first, too, until he broke through uh, with the video games, with the TV announcing and things like that. And the other thing was he didn't really have a lot of success in Seattle either. But again, as I'm sure you've talked to other people in the league around the industry, um, up there, John Clayton is a big proponent of Tom Flores because he covered the Seahawks back then. And he said that should not be held against Tom Flores. That was the worst ownership in a modern major sports history. So uh, there's so many different factors as to why he's not in yet. But there's also um, some good that has been done to kind of alleviate this this log jam. And, and and again, I know you're you're a big fan of it and a proponent of it, and we'll see exactly where it goes from here. But it just feels like this is this is the right thing to do and the right time to do it while he's still here to enjoy it with his family, with his friends, with his fans. A thousand percent. And Paul, when we were putting together the show, when we were looking at putting the rundown together and who we wanted on the show, it was really important for us that we had someone that came and talked to us that covers the team regularly, that knows this team, that knows this organization, that knows what is important to the Raiders, everything, right? And so when you, in your experience, what would it mean for not only the team, but the fan base to have Coach Flores inducted into the Hall of Fame, where, frankly, a lot of people believe that's where he should be and he should have been 10, 15, 20 years ago? Yeah, as, as rabid and as crazy as Raider Nation is, it's also just as inclusive, as long as you buy in, right? And, and I've noticed that over the years. I mean, it's, it's diverse. It's eclectic. Uh, it, it, it has all walks of life in it. Um, There's one section of it, though, that I've seen, and and it's personal to me, being a a Latino male. And I can't even say I'm a young Latino male anymore. (laughs) But, I mean, the man, you know, when I was growing up in Southern California, um, he reminded me so much of my paternal grandpa. Mm. And the first time I ever met Tom Flores, true story, uh, we I graduate high school, Barstow High School, class of 1988. We go to Hawaii for our senior trip. We fly back. We're getting our luggage at LAX, and I see... Raider bags starting to come through the luggage carousel. And I'm sitting, I'm looking, I'm like, oh, which Raider was on the flight with us? And I look and I see a man come up and grab his bags and it was Tom. So I tell Tom this story all the time that I met you when I was 18 years old. And now it's just funny how the world goes around. And I I tell you that story because that's how personal it was to me. And it's personal to the the Latino fan base, especially the Mexican-American Chicano fan base of the Raiders, which is burgeoning. And as a huge and, and Tom Flores and, and Jim Plunkett, you know, in Mexico, they're, they're icons down there as well. And, and you saw that when the Raiders are playing down there, too. So it, it means so much more than just, oh, great. We got another Hall of Famer, so to speak, for the Raider fans. It, it's 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 personal. And it goes back to the time. And I, and I just go back to, to my my young days when I'm 12 years old and the Raiders moved to L.A. And I'm like, oh, oh, that's what they're all about. That's why my dad was a Raider fan. So I, I get it. And from. The Latino fan perspective, it's another step toward acceptance, but it's also not just acceptance, but celebrating all the achievements finally and letting the man have his day in the sun. Yeah, I mean, very well said, Paul. And I think that the NFL has done, you know, I give credit where it's due. I think they've done a lot better as of late, kind of preaching this message of inclusion and, you know, everyone's welcome and all that, right? But I think that when you look at that, that message of inclusion, I think it carries a lot more weight if you put a guy like Coach Flores in the Hall of Fame, right? And not only simply simply because he's a Mexican-American, because he's Latino, because you look at his resume, and the resume speaks for itself. And it just, to me, I feel like the message is, it's just so much more effective if you can put him in the Hall of Fame, and you can give young Mexican-American kids out there, guys like me, right, who are a little bit younger than you, probably not too much, Paul, but guys who are in, you know, <laughs> a little bit younger than you, guys like me, kids, that, you know, one day that my kids can look and say, hey, there's a guy who looks like me in the Hall of Fame. There is a guy who looks like me that not only was a quarterback, not only a coach, he was a front office executive, and I think that's a powerful message the NFL has a chance to, to kind of send to kids and do it in the right way. And when you take, even if you were to take that off, which you can't, nor should you, you look at his resume and and I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of, can you tell the history of the NFL without mentioning this person? Absolutely not. The first Latino starting quarterback in the NFL, the first minority head coach to win a Super Bowl and did it twice. Uh, The first person, regardless of race, to win a Super Bowl as a player, an assistant coach and a head coach uh, before Mike Ditka did it. And you throw all these things together, and then you're like, what are, what are people missing? Oh, I guess it's Seattle. I guess it's Al Davis. I guess that he 
left before he coached for 10 years here, but for for that five, six year period here from 1980 through 85, there was, his record was unbelievable. And when you look at what his record is against other coaches that are already in Canton, it's unbelievable that, that he's not there and doesn't get more respect. He was six and zero against Don Shula, the winningest coach in NFL history while he was with the Raiders. And I believe he finished seven and one, uh, something like that. He, he's got a winning record against Bill uh, Parcells, a winning record against Bill Walsh, a winning record against Don Lan- uh, uh, against Tom Landry, Don Coriel, who was a finalist with them. He was 12 and five against Air Coriel. I mean, what else needs to be said? Then you throw everything else in there about inclusion. It's a no brainer. Yeah. And you know, it's funny too. And that's, that's one of the things that we talked a lot about uh, the last time that coach was up for the, the hall of fame and he didn't get in was we were comparing him to the other coaches that did get in. And right. I'm yeah. not, I'm not here to, to disparage anyone for who's in the hall of fame, who's not, all, not in the hall of fame. But like you said, you look at those records and if you, as a player, as a coach, as anyone, right, you want to see how you did against the best. You want to see how you stacked up against the very best at their jobs. And he held up incredibly well. He held up at a historic rate. So to me, it's just another, another what? Like, wh- what are yeah. we doing here type moment? I don't get it. I really don't. Well, especially when you talk to the guys that he coached, the Hall of Famers that he coached. Marcus That's another Allen thing, is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Marcus Allen is on the record as saying, hey, look, uh, you know, people make too much about X's and O's. This guy was a calming influence in this locker room, and, and he held this team together. Howie Long, I talked to Howie Long about the man. Same thing. He said, you can't put a price tag on what he meant to that locker room in terms of all the colorful characters that were in there. And there was the ice man, just keeping it cool, keeping it smooth and keeping the machine going uh, until it stopped. And uh, again, to have four rings, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing that, that uh, it's taken this long to get to this point, but, but maybe this injustice will be done soon enough. And, and um, you know, it's always hard. I have, I have conversations with, with selectors and uh, you know, I'll, keep their name out of it, but they, they take pride as they should uh, in, in making it a very selective hall. So anytime I say, Oh, well, I want somebody in Oh, that you can't just say that so-and-so should be in. You have to take somebody out. Okay. Well then give me Tom Flores and his four rings and I'll take Marv Levy and his four Super Bowl losses out. Oh, oh, I didn't want to hear about that. And I'm like, again, I'm not disparaging Marv Levy should be in the hall of fame. He is in the hall of fame, but there's just something that's missing. It's not a complete hall when you're missing somebody as accomplished and is uh, diverse, really, as Tom Flores. I'm just wrapping up with Paul Gutierrez. And, and Paul, if you were to explain Coach Flores to someone, if you were to explain his resume, what he meant to the game, for someone, you know, one, one day from now, you know, many years from now, my kids, if you were to explain Tom Flores to them and his importance to the game and why he deserves to be enshrined in Canton, I mean, what do you, what do you say? Like, kind of what's your pitch? A groundbreaking pioneer who succeeded at every level of the game when given the opportunity. And really, it's that simple. Then you throw everything else on top of it. You throw in the, the diversity. You throw in uh, what he meant to a certain community. That's just extra. That's, that's like to, to go from an A to an A+, plus, right? Um, that's, that's how I present it. That's how I talk about it. And sometimes, Eddie, to be honest, I, I sometimes can't see the forest for the trees because I'm so close to it. I've been so passionate about it. And I'm so happy and I'm so excited for him that we really might be this close to it finally happening. Uh, you know, one of the stories that broke my heart two years ago, um, he's sitting in the in the stands at uh, uh, the Canton Canton um, for the Hall of Fame induction ceremony. And he sees one of the players he drafted, Kevin Mawai with the, with the Seattle Seahawks. And he gets a text. He looks at his phone and uh, he sees that it's from Cliff Branch. And Cliff was texting him to tell him, hey, they just added this new blue ribbon committee. You're in, coach. And, and, and Tom told me that he looked at it and he put it down and thought, I'm going to respond to Cliff when I get a second to be a little more thoughtful in my response. He was going to write him back, no, we're both in. So it means a lot to him. It means a lot to his former players. And again, it would mean so much more for him to enjoy it uh, while he's still here with us and, and with his family as well. Yeah, very well said. It obviously means a lot to everyone in this building. The, the candidacy for coaches is something that's very near and dear to a lot of our hearts in this, in this department and really in this organization. So, Paul Gutierrez, man, we thank you so much for carving out a little bit of time for us. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, hopefully the next time we see you, we're doing it uh, in real life, not this virtual thing. Sounds good, Eddie. Thanks for having me.